Let's start here on page number 184, the, you know, with chapter number six. This chapter is a great chapter in the book, frankly. It's a great chapter because it's about real estate contracts, clauses that specifically have to do with contracts. And if you look here at the middle of page number 184, you'll see the term hold harmless agreement at the middle of page number 184. This term hold harmless, this is a clause that is very frequently used in listings. This is very frequently used in listing contracts, very common. Basically what the hold harmless provision says is the hold harmless provision basically says that if the seller gives you misinformation regarding the property, if the seller gives you misinformation regarding the property, you're not liable for that. So if the seller says, for example, that the plumbing is brand new, but the plumbing is actually shot, I don't know what good plumbing is versus bad plumbing. I'm just going to believe what that particular seller says. Now, of course, what that means is I'm going to be repeating that. Are we going to have to go through that with, with her as well? Yeah. They're making coffee. Perfect. Great. <laughs> We'll wait till it brews. Yes, ma'am. No, earlier we, we had an example where the seller gave the real estate agent the wrong information. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't hold harmless Not back. Clauses. That was 15 years ago. You know. Okay, so hold har harmless clauses. This stuff co just constantly iterate. We constantly iterate on our contracts. So okay. let me just pick that. Let me, let me, you know, do me a huge favor, only because we have four more chapters and there's a camera if you haven't noticed, so it'll be hard for me to edit. If you can just hold your questions maybe till I call for them, that would just help me out with the, with the, with the pace of today. Um, so if you look at page number 184, where it says hold harmless clause, basically this is a very, very common clause in listing contracts. How, how this works essentially is the seller agrees to protect, indemnify, and hold the broker harmless from claims resulting from incorrect information supplied to the broker by the seller. Now, this is not for uh, obvious defects. So for example, if there's a stain in the ceiling and it's clearly leaking, and the seller tells you that the roof is brand new, well, you can see that the roof is not brand new. This has to do more so with like latent defects, things that we might not be able to see uh, just with the naked eye, right? So new plumbing, new electrical, and it happens to be old plumbing and old electrical, the old harmless clause is going to protect us here on page number 184. So again, what is the hold harmless? It says that the seller agrees to protect, indemnify, and hold the broker harmless from claims resulting from incorrect information supplied by the seller. Now, if you look at 185, you'll see in bold on page number 185, there's only one clause in the whole listing contract that actually has to be in bold and it's required under the civil code. Anytime you take a residential listing in bold, in a font not less than 10 point, you have to disclose to the seller that the real estate commission rates are negotiable. So we have to tell the seller in a font not less than 10 point and in bold typeface that real estate commission rates are negotiable. So you cannot say that they're fixed by law because they're not. You can charge someone whatever you want and you have to tell them that in bold. And I actually wanna show you where this is in the contract. If you look at page number 187, in paragraph four on page 187, in paragraph four on 187, you will see in bold, in a font not less than 10 point, there's a notice to the seller that real estate commission rates are negotiable. So there's none of this, hey, it has to be 6% or it can't be less than 6%. They're completely 100% negotiable. Now, back on page number 186, what you'll see on page 186, see where it says exclusive listings? Realize that on page 186, remember the listing contract is a bilateral contract, meaning that a promise is given in exchange for another promise, right? A promise is given for a promise. Remember, there's two parties, of course, to the listing contract. Those parties are the seller and the broker. The seller promises to pay a commission and the broker promises to try. The broker promises to use due diligence to try to find a buyer. So each one of these sides, both the broker 
and the seller are promising something. Hence, this is a bilateral contract. Both the seller and the broker promise to use due, but the seller promises to pay a commission and the broker promises to use due diligence to try to find a buyer. Hence, the contract is a bilateral one. Now, here, let me show you something here really quickly. On page number 188, if you look at 188 in paragraph 8, if you look at page 188, paragraph 8, you'll see the last sentence of paragraph 8 is in bold. The last sentence of paragraph 8 is in bold on page number 188. And right next to that, I would write the words, hold harmless. I would write the words, hold harmless. So the hold harmless clause is a clause in the listing that says that the seller agrees to protect, indemnify, and hold the broker harmless from claims resulting from incorrect information supplied by the seller. Now, your question naturally might be, hey, we looked at a case, uh, Furla versus John Douglas, where in that case, the uh, seller represented to the broker that the house was 5,500 square feet, when it in fact was like 4,400 square feet. Shouldn't the hold harmless clause have protected them? But remember, this was back in the late 90s. The key thing as to whether this is going to work or not is, was it obvious to a reasonable realtor that the house was not actually 5,500 square feet. So again, if the roof is clearly old, roof is like completely dilapidated, and the seller says, hey, the roof is brand new, this hold harmless clause isn't going to protect me because it's obvious that the roof does, in fact, leak. Same thing here. The question in Furla versus John Douglas from an earlier chapter is, would it have been obvious, even today in 2013, when we have this hold harmless clause, the question is, would it have been obvious to the naked eye, an average realtor, to realize that the house was not 4,400 square feet, and that, or that it was not 5,500 square feet, but it was actually 4,400 square feet? That's the question. So this hold harmless clause isn't bulletproof. It's just for stuff mainly that's latent, like plumbing, electrical, zoning, for example. That might, we might be covered there. Now, another thing on page number 187, that's important. On 187, you'll see in paragraph 4A2, page 187, paragraph 4A2 on 187. Right next to this, I would write the words safety clause. I would write the words safety clause. So the safety clause is a clause in a contract, 4A2. The safety clause is a clause in a contract that's amazing for the real estate agent. This says, even after the listing expires, even after the listing expires, you may be entitled to a commission. This is golden for the real estate agent. Even after the listing expires, you still might have to pay your broker. Now here's how this works. It's in paragraph 4A2 on page number 187. This clause says, I got three days after the listing expires, to write a list. This list is all of the people that I personally introduced to the property. This is a list of all the people that I personally introduced to that property. If within, let's say, 60 days, so in 4A2 on 187, I would write the number 60. If within 60 days of the listing expiring, you try to sell it to someone from my list, you might have to pay me a commission. And this is 60 days after the listing expires. So if you look at 4A2, it says, if within blank calendar days, right? Just go ahead and write the word number 60 in there. If within 60 calendar days of the listing expiring, you sell it to someone that I introduced to that property, you may still owe me a full commission, even after the listing has expired, completely golden. So I'll take any questions you have in a second. I just want to talk about these, just review these two clauses. First, hold harmless. The seller agrees to protect the broker if the seller lies to us and we get sued repeating that lie. Safety clause, we may be entitled to a commission as the listing agent even after the listing expires. We have three days after the listing expires to compile a list of all the people we introduced to that property. If the seller, within 60 days, sells it to someone from our list, they're going to owe us 
a full commission, even after the listing expires. I appreciate your patience. Any, any questions? Yes, ma'am. No, could be anything. Whatever you write in the blank. 30, 60, 900. You could write whatever you want. As an illustration, though, I chose 60. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a problem. You might, have, you might have a claim from both agents. That's why whenever you take a listing on an expired, whenever you come behind another agent on an expired listing, you always want to ask two questions. Number one, can I see your prior listing contract? We want to see how many days of safety clause. And question number two, can I get a list? Is there a list of people that, I, that that prior agent gave you? If there's no list, don't worry about it. No safety clause. If there's no number listed in 4A2, don't worry about it. There's no safety clause. We need both. Number of days in 4A2 and what? A list submitted when? Within three days, Within three days of the listing expiring. Thank you. No problem. Because the seller has to agree to that. The question is, why can't you put like 900 in there? Because if you, you can do whatever, yeah, put 90, put 200, put 100. It's whatever you and the seller agree on. Now, the problem, of course, is if you put 200 in there, and then I question you at the time, because remember, this is at the time the listing is being taken. And I'm like, hey, what is 200? And you're like, well, within 200 days after the listing expires, if you try to sell it to anybody that I showed the property to, the, most sellers are going to say, damn, 200 days, that's kind of a long time. But, but, you, but you're right, though. You can, whatever you and the seller uh, negotiate. But you, the point is well taken. It's, like, it's, it's really just an assessment itself. It is. You'll see when you get out there. <laughs> yeah. It is to protect the agent, though. But yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. And that's her point, right? Like, that's why the longer the, the longer the period, the better for the agent. I'm just saying, like, most things in life, there's more than just you in the room, you know? There's you and the other guy you're doing business with. So they're going to say, hey, I don't want, you know, 100 or 200. I'm going to give you nine months. If you can't sell within nine months, then that's, that's on you, you know? But... No, no, you'll lose that 100%. Because that's the point of this, right? If it's 61, they can do it. So if they literally waited 60 days to do it? No problem. Yeah, no problem. Totally within their right. Totally within their right, yeah. But that's the point, though, right? You want as long as possible here. Yes, sir. No, it's only in the time period that the listing is specified. So, but all, all great questions, though. But it's like these are questions that indicate you're getting it, right? Don't I want a long safety clause? Hell yeah, you want a long safety clause for sure, right? You want to make sure that you're going to get paid, you know, even after the listing expires. Now, if you look here, a uh, couple other things, sir. If you look at page number 191. It, we're, again, we're still inside of chapter number six. We're still inside chapter six. If you look at page 191, exclusive right to sell. Now, the exclusive authorization and right to sell listing, this is on page number 191, I would write the words most common. This is the most common type of listing contract in California. The exclusive right to sell listing is most common. The reason that you know that this is the most common is because it's going to give us the greatest chance of making money. This contract gives us the greatest chance of getting paid. Because why? Here's what this contract says. Look, if I have your house listed and I find a buyer, you pay me. Which seems natural, right? You, I have the house listed, I find a buyer, you pay me. If it's this contract and another agent finds the buyer, you still got to pay me. If another agent finds the buyer. This contract also says if the seller is holding their own open house, so the seller runs their own ads online, and the seller finds their own buyer, the seller still has to pay the agent. Does this sound pretty good for the real estate agent? Oh yeah, this is freaking awesome, right? That's why when somebody says, hey, I wanna sell my house, what do we take? The exclusive right to sell listing and move on. Now, this is just, by the way, at the bottom of 191, you'll see the term safety clause in bold at the bottom half of 191, safety clause. We talked about what the safety clause is already. What does the safety clause say? 
you're entitled to a commission even after what? Expiration of the listing for some number of days, 20, 30, 200, whatever you put in the safety clause box. So the safety clause allows for a commission even after the listing expires. Now, this is different than at the top of 192. The top of 192 is an exclusive agency contract. Now, in the exclusive agency contract, the seller can sell it on their own and pay no commission. The exclusive agency contract says the seller reserves the right to sell the property on their own without liability for a commission. This is the exclusive agency contract. So exclusive right to sell, this contract says no matter who finds the buyer, even you, Mr. Seller, you're still going to pay the agent. Exclusive agency contract says you find a buyer as an agent, I got to pay you. If another agent finds a buyer, the listing agent still gets paid. However, now here there's a loophole. In the agency contract at the top of 192, in the agency contract, the seller reserves the right to sell the property on their own without liability for a commission. This is the exclusive agency contract here at the top of 192. Now, at the bottom of 192, next to open listing, I would write the words non-exclusive. The open listing is a non-exclusive listing contract. Now, what does non-exclusive mean? It means any number of agents can be hired. Any number of agents can be hired on an open listing. The only person that's going to get paid on an open listing is the procuring cause. Only the procuring cause gets paid on an open listing. Now, what is the procuring cause? The procuring cause is the person that, picture a boulder, a person that starts that boulder down that hill and the deal closes with no interruptions. That's the procuring cause. Whoever starts an uninterrupted chain of events that will lead to a sale. They are known as the what again? Procuring cause here at the top of page 193. Now, here's the question. A lot of people ask, well, what do I actually have to do? Isn't it true that if I'm the first agent that showed you that house and you end up buying that house, that you automatically owe me a commission. No, I could show you a property, write an offer, offer is rejected. Two days later, you could write another offer on that house, same offer, structured the same way with another agent, that, that offer gets accepted somehow, I don't get anything. Because I didn't initiate an uninterrupted chain of events that lead to a sale. So my offer got rejected, right? My offer was turned down. I'm not the procuring cause. The agent that, that wrote the offer again, got the offer accepted, took that to close, they're the person that's actually going to get paid. Now you'll see on 193, this is Coldwell Banker on 193, Coldwell Banker versus Pepper Tree Office Center Associates, middle of 193. This is a procuring cause case. What does procuring cause mean? It means who is the one who initiated the uninterrupted chain of events that led to a sale? The plaintiff had an exclusive agency listing. We know what the agency one is. It says the seller can sell the property on their own and pay no commission. The agency contract existed. The court held that submitting a one-page brochure and forwarding floor plans to the broker of a prospective tenant did not reasonably constitute procuring cause. So procuring cause is not just, hey, I emailed you a floor plan. Procuring cause is not even, hey, I told you about the house first. Procuring cause isn't even, I wrote the offer first. It's the person who writes the offer that gets accepted that causes the transaction to close. Now, from a business perspective as real estate agents, this is the importance of having a listing. Because if you have a listing, it doesn't matter who brings the buyer. You'll at least be entitled to your listing share of the commission, right? It's only when you're messing around with a bunch of buyers and the buyer's disloyal and buys through someone else that you'll end up maybe getting burned. But if you have an exclusive right to sell listing in it with a safety clause and a hold harmless and no matter who finds the buyer, you get paid, whatever, right? Write it through me, write it through someone else. At least I know I'm going to get the listing side of that commission. Any questions about these three at all? Yes, ma'am. Guess the offer accepted? and then transaction closes. So write the offer, offer is accepted, transaction closes. That's what again? Procuring cause. That's the procuring cause. 
Now, under the statute of frauds, we know under the statute of frauds that certain contracts have to what? Be in writing in order to be enforceable by a judge. That's uh, what the statute of frauds is. Now, if you look at the top of 194, again, listings for real estate. If you're going to list real estate, does that listing contract have to be in writing? Yeah, says who? Statute of frauds, right? The statute of frauds. The only exception might be, the only exception might be if you have a listing already and work continues on that listing after expiration, you might get paid off, off uh, estoppel or ratification, as it says at the top of 194. But generally, in order to get paid on a listing, what does it have to be? In writing, says who? Statute of frauds, right? So oral listings generally are not valid. Now, if you look at the bottom of page 199, bottom of 199 where it says finder's fees, don't get caught off guard on this uh, finder fee thing. Remember, for our exam, California, does California care if you pay an unlicensed person? No, no whatever, pay them whatever you want. Who's going to be pissed? RESPA, federal, on a residential transaction with a what? With a loan. When you have a residential transaction with a loan, then a RESPA provision kicks in, which requires that you be licensed in order to collect a finder's fee. The very last portion of Chapter 6 is the purchase contract and also a, 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 a lease contract. I would encourage you to spend some time and kind of go through that to familiarize yourself with the purchase contract as well as, uh, as, well as the listing contract.